Okay, um, so um, thanks for uh, allowing me to speak to this group. It's always more uh, nerve-wracking to speak at home than it is on the road. But um, I'm also uh, thank. Um, it's always difficult to follow Harriet as well. She said, you know, it was nice that uh, she could be first, or rather than follow me. But I disagree. Um, so I would like to um, start by with this title that's a little bit provocative, Companion Diagnostics, the Pathologist as a Prescribing Physician. And I will try to convince you in the next 25 minutes that, in fact, that's a role pathologists play, or not exactly, but rather physicians who determine which patients are eligible for which drugs. Um, I'll start with a quick disclosure here. I'm a consultant, stockholder, and scientific founder of HistoRx and author on the Yale-held patent on aqua technology, which I'll talk about. So, will this ever happen? That is, in this era of personalized medicines, will we actually be writing prescriptions? And, and arguably, there are some drugs, four of them shown over here, for which we sort of already do. Well, not exactly, but I think there's no oncologist in this audience that would give either this drug, which is tamoxifen, or this drug, which is Herceptin, without an indication from the pathologist. That is, unless we know that the patient is expressing HER2 by IHC or FISH or estrogen receptor, by ER or PR uh, by um, IHC, those drugs wouldn't be given. And so what I want to really look at today is how exactly that evidence is, is, is comes about and whether or not we should be looking at that evidence in a different way. And specifically, if we think about a, a disease like diabetes, the way uh, the pathway is sort of obtain a sample, blood, a tissue sample, which in this case is blood, and then do an objective measurement that has a known coefficient of variation and a known standard deviation and, and standards that the lab can be tested against and then ultimately treat with the appropriate therapy. In breast cancer, it kind of works the same way. You get a core biopsy, so you're obtaining a tissue sample, but then we make a histologic diagnosis and then measure estrogen receptor, which is a subjective judgment. And so then we treat with the appropriate therapy. And is that an issue? That is, should we try to place more evidence in, evident in, in medicine by changing this step? So here's an example of a small study done at HistoRx with some colleagues there where they looked at 100 patients and had different pathologists read those same patients. And if you were one of the patients who's, who, if these was, this was actually your pathologist and this was your, this is not actually the uh, sample, but depending on which pathologist you had, you would or would not receive tamoxifen in 10 percent of the cases. That is, if you were this patient and you were called negative by pathologist 3, you wouldn't have gotten TAM, but you were called positive by pathologist 1, then you would. That's concerning. It shouldn't be dependent, I would argue, on which pathologist you have which should determine your therapy. And so this is where uh, one of the things that we set out to look at in the lab. Um, this might be one of the reasons for problems, and I've shown this before, is because we judge estrogen receptor or HER2 or many of the IHC slides by intensity. And the human eye is not built for that task, which I'll prove to you by having you all tell me which is darker, A or B. And everybody, may, many of you have seen this before, but everyone, the appearance is that A is darker because we know B is in shadow and there's context, but in fact they're on ident identical color. It was a little bit disturbing that when I showed this to a visiting pathologist, they said, nah, that's a trick. They didn't believe it. <laughs> so our goal is objective companion diagnostic tests. And there, there's three points that I'd like to talk about. First, standardization of the analytic methods, that is actually how we're determining it. Then two other key points, which I'll spend a little less time on, standardization and validation of the analytic reagents, which turn out to be a problem sometimes, not necessarily uh, always, but something to be considered. And then finally, careful management of the specimens or avoidant, avoidance and or management of pre-analytic variables, which also turn out to be very important if you're going to accurately measure companion diagnostic tests. So the way we measure, as already been alluded to, is the aqua technology, which is schematized here. Basically, there's a, uh, it's entirely based on co-localization between different fluorescent markers and then quantitation of that co-localization. A region of interest is defined by a cytokeratin or something in, in breast cancer, but defined by cytokeratin. And then ultimately, compartments and, and uh, measurements are made on the basis of a scattering algorithm and on the basis of quantification within specific compartments defined by that scattering algorithm. Uh, basically, the steps are shown here, but I won't go through that in too much detail other than to say that after you actually get the aqua score, which is just a concentration, you have to then convert it to an absolute concentration or some set of normalized standards. And this step was probably, in retrospect, equally important as all these other steps. 
that is knowing exactly where you are on the scale and being able to standardize is as important as getting an absolute amount. And so this is an example of that standardization for estrogen receptor, which is what I'll talk about first, where we looked at recombinant estrogen receptor in absolute amounts and then standardized that to different cell lines. Cell lines you could then place into a tissue microarray and fix in formalin and treat just like breast cancer and then see how they responded and generate a standard curve by which you could measure aqua score on the cell lines and then convert back to picograms of, microgram total, uh, picograms of ER per microgram total protein on a linear uh, conversion curve like this. That would be nice and we could always go back to using that as a standard if cell lines were always the same. But as you all know, cell lines vary from batch to batch and from Sierra, Sierra, different Sierras change cell lines and in fact how dense the cell lines grow may change their expression as well. And so in fact what's here is a standardized array of actual patients or tissue from patients that we ultimately standardize back to, to in order to gain absolute reproducibility. This is where we started in 2002 with Bob Camp uh, wrote some software that worked on this Delta Vision platform and ultimately Bob and I paid for and through the, uh, a grant from the Breast Cancer Alliance of Greenwich and Connecticut um, paid for this which was our first dedicated device and the software is all written by this guy who's not here today but everyone probably knows Bob Camp. Um, shortly thereafter HistoRx commercialized this and this is the HistoRx uh, soft uh, box and, and platform for the delivery of the Aqua technology and most recently <laughs> this has been licensed to Aperio where it's now delivered on the ScanScope platform. Um, the reproducibility in this example for uh, estrogen receptor alpha is, is similar to what you might get for glucose if you were measuring it in laboratory medicine. That is the coefficient of variation is under 10 percent which is the standard in laboratory medicine. You can see we're actually under 5 percent. Different days, different runs, different slides, different operators, different boxes and that's how you calculate these, these co coefficients are calculated by the uh, group at HistoRx. So what, is the, what are the implications of that? And this is uh, something that we've done in our lab fairly recently, led by Ali Welsh, is we take this standard curve and then ask the question, okay, if we know that this is the cutoff, that this is the threshold between the patient who is ER negative and the patient who is ER positive, and then we go look back at patients who were, who were scored previously, are they, how accurate is that scoring that pathologists have done in the past? And are patients missing an opportunity to be declared eligible for a therapy? Remember, that's what the pathologists are going to do is declare these patients eligible for tamoxifen. And while it's bad to call a patient eligible when they're not, it's much worse to call a patient not eligible when they are because then they're going to miss the opportunity to be treated by a therapy that has some effect. So this actually is, the first thing is to show is does this really represent the threshold? And in order to do that, we looked at, um, we were fortunate in that estrogen receptor has nuclear localization. So we could look at, at these, these squares, which actually look black until you uh, change the levels by doing Photoshop or basically contract the dynamic range so that you can see that this last specimen, or this is the first specimen that was considered negative right here, is actually negative even when you expand it so you can just see background. Whereas that next specimen, this one here, is the first positive specimen and if you contract the levels sufficiently, you can actually see that any signal that's present is present in the nucleus. So we're actually detecting the difference or the, the threshold of detection of this machine, of this device in, these patient, in this patient set, not that large a patient set, but it's two picograms per microgram. And so that defines a molecular or biological threshold above which patients, we can ask the question then, are those patients, should they be considered eligible for, for tamoxifen or a related therapy? And so we asked that in our cohort of 600 breast cancer patients, actually a subset of that cohort. And what you can see that if you cut the, the patients at this cut point of two picograms per microgram, there's some patients that were negative that were actually called negative by the pathologist, the vast majority. And then the pink ones are called, are the sort of purplish color, I guess, were called positive by both the pathologist and by, uh, and they're above the threshold. But the red ones are kind of interesting. Those are the ones that are above the threshold but were called negative by the pathologist. Now the ones on this end, it's hard to explain why that occurred. But the ones down here are, are probably just below the threshold of detection since the pathologist always does a counter stain with hematoxylin, which probably blocks subtle, subtle, subtle signal generated by chromogens. And you can see that the red population actually behaves sort of intermediately between the purple population and the blue population in terms of the total outcome. In a more recent and second and independent cohort, uh, 
We looked at this again. This is uh, Bruce Hafty's uh, breast cancer array, uh, YTMA-130, and again found that there's a, a, a group of patients, in this case colored both red and orange, that are clearly above the threshold but were called negative by the pathologist. And those patients, again, do very well. In fact, the patients that were misassigned by some mechanism yet to be determined but don't, aren't subtly different do very well. The patients, even though right near the threshold, however, behave overall like the positives, suggesting that probably we should look and probably um, there's potential for response to therapy as well. Now, these are not response to therapy. We, don't, we haven't done this yet in a cohort where we have re response to therapy. A small percentage of these patients were treated with tamoxifen, uh, but, we, but insufficient numbers to do any statistical analysis on. So the real question is not how do they behave prognostically, which is shown here, but how predictive is this? And will this group of patients actually um, <clears throat> respond to tamoxifen, that is, should they be given the drug? And so we looked at a few other cohorts to begin to try to ask what the general level of false negatives is, if that is, in fact, a false negative or misclassification or discordance is. And you can see this was a breast cancer um, uh, cohort from the British Columbia Cancer Agency, and all the blues were called negative but had aqua scores clearly above baseline. This is a much larger study, SWOG 9313, which was a, a uh, trial of AC versus A and then C, so unrelated to ER and PR. But um, here you can see that the light blue dots here were all called negative by the local standard pathologist, and many of them are, are quite a bit higher than where they, we might uh, expect them to be uh, when they're analyzed in this way. So the bad news is I don't have that punchline yet, but just rather the proposal of what we intend to do to try to get this. We do have fairly good evidence that discordance is important, and as I just showed you, but to really find out if they're real <laughs> false negative rate um, I am proposing the following three studies. I'll be going to San Francisco on Friday to, for this proposal with SWOG, although we haven't decided yet whether we'll do whole slides or TMAs. Everything I've shown you has been on, done on TMAs, and it's a good criticism of this work to say, well, that's not how we treat patients. We treat patients on the basis of a pathologist read of a whole slide, not a TMA, and so we have to consider that. Um, I've also talked with Mike DiGiovanna about a brief exposure trial of endocrine therapy here at Yale for ER-negative patients. And then finally, I've spoken with a few people, uh, some advocates regarding potential retrospective collection of specimens from um, women in the Army of Women um, that Avon organizes. So hopefully in a year or two, I'll be able to come back to you with these results. So that sort of gets us to the, the first um, bit of, or talking about standardization of the analytic methods with the idea that if pathologists use more standardized methods, they may be able to qualify more patients or qualify patients more accurately for drugs. The second issue that I'd like to discuss is standardization and validation of analytic reagents. And this is a little bit scary, and that it's something that our lab has experienced, is that what's in, when you do all these procedures that we do when we're studying proteins, is largely our probe is antibodies. And where do we get antibodies from? We buy them. We buy them from any one of 185 companies roughly out there that sell antibodies. However, those companies that sell antibodies have no obligation to actually check that the antibody in the tube is any good. And so you're left um, to find out whether or not that analytic reagent that you're using actually binds to the analyte which you're looking at. So this is a way too complex slide for this size lecture, but this is basically the algorithm that we've generated over the last three to five years for how we test this, because probably somewhere in the neighborhood between a quarter and a half of the antibodies that are in the tube don't match the label. And so I would encourage you all to carefully validate antibodies using some schema. This was actually recently published in Biotech, Biotechniques in the March issue, so it's available. But here's a couple examples of antibodies, of ways to validate that have worked in the past. And, and although they're somewhat um, laborious compared to just looking at it, the answers that you get are a lot more compelling than just looking at the result. This is an example where a collaborator, Elaine Allred, transformed estrogen receptor into, into a inducible, a puromycin inducible promoter, and so you can see that as you get increasing amounts, the antibody shows increasing expression levels. And so that's a pretty compelling way to know that the antibody is actually binding to the protein of interest. And perhaps a more compelling way is to use siRNA knockdown. And this is work we've done more recently on, on validating a Staphman antibody, showing that when you uh, have a control amount and then you knock down the protein of interest, it actually goes away and it also goes away in a correlative manner on the immunofluorescence study. 
And so either by uh, correlated expression or knockdown are two ways that we've taken to in the lab um, out of this long list of different approaches that uh, show us that antibodies are, in fact, what it says on the label, and then ultimately we show reproducibility as well. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, another issue that comes up in this is the management of the specimens, because frequently a specimen will come into pathology in many different ways. And so the best specimens that we get are specimens that are fixed immediately. You, very rarely those specimens are frozen immediately. More commonly, those specimens are fixed in formalin immediately. And in fact, it's fairly common in the case of core biopsies or endoscopic biopsies, where the biopsy will be removed immediately from the patient and the time between cutting off circulation and initial penetration by formalin is measured in minutes. And so those specimens tend to be pretty good, whereas tumor resections may sit on the bench for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour, a couple hours, sometimes even four or five hours before they are dissected and see formalin. And so we ask the question, what difference does that make and does that affect many of those potential false negatives? And are we as pathologists declaring patients ineligible, not because their tumors didn't express something, but because it sat on the bench too long and that something that we were looking for went away. And that's what's shown here is the beginnings of a study on estrogen receptor expression in patients where we had both a core needle biopsy and a tumor resection. And what you can see here is that in nearly every case, the core needle biopsy had a significantly higher level of expression than the resection specimen for estrogen receptor. And so what this represents is, we believe, the degradation of estrogen receptor that's occurring between the time that the cut circulation is cut off and the time that the estrogen receptor is measured. Now, at this institution, we 90 percent of the estrogen receptor we do, in fact, maybe closer to 100 percent, is measured on core biopsies. So this is not a reason that pathologists are declaring patients ineligible for drugs. However, it does happen at some institutions, and here as well, Sometimes estrogen re receptor is looked at in, in resection specimens where attention may not have been paid to fixation conditions. Just to sort of summarize this, if you look at the heterogeneity of estrogen receptor, which is another ongoing study in the lab um, that I'm not talking about today, the heterogeneity between patients on average is about 150 points. The heterogeneity between a biopsy and a resection is almost as high, 134 points. So even though there's lots of patient-to-patient -patient variation, the difference between a core biopsy and a resection is really substantial. Difference between the region of a single patient is actually about 40 points, and that's kind of interesting as well that you can have that too much variability around, and explains why it may be important to look at more than just one spot on a tissue microarray or more than one or two fields when you're looking at it. Or it may actually be better to do that, because sometimes looking around a heterogeneous specimen can provide spurious information, which We'll talk, to, talk about it another day. Okay, so finally the last thing I want to talk about in the last five or so minutes is to talk about um, another place where pathologists are prescribing drugs. And this is from CAP Today. These are two pages. The, the, this fairly recent issue of CAP Today, the last issue from last year, um, this, uh, I should, since there's not a lot, too many pathologists, well, there's a fair number of you here, but you probably know that this is the most widely read journal by pathologists. Now, that seems kind of funny because it's not a journal, but this is sent for free to every pathologist in the country. There's about 15,000 of us, and we all get this, okay? And so if you open it up, you see these full-page ads from various drug companies that tell us that, <coughs> that we need, that histology matters. And, that we, and the whole idea behind these, this is that, that histology matters, is that it's now critical to histotype properly. So here we go again. We got another subjective assessment that's going to lead to prescription of a drug. In this case, we're going to, it's going to, uh, adenocarcinomas have been shown to respond better to docetaxel gemcitabine uh, uh, compared to pemetrexid. Squamous cell carcinomas are not eligible for bevacizumab, and, and et cetera. There's some other, um, uh, a number of different um, reasons now to accurately determine a squamous cell carcinoma from an adenocarcinoma, and the standard as as we all know, is the pathologist looks at it and gives you the answer. And even first-year residents in pathology can largely tell you the difference between squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma between 70 and 80 percent of the time. But that's probably not good enough, especially if it's your patient or, or you 
is you'd probably like to know above at least 95% of the time be accurate in that decision. So here's one. The problem is we get very tiny specimens now. That's all we'll get is a little tiny biopsy from, an endos from a bronchoscopy or something. And we have to then decide, is this a squamous cell or, or adenocarcinoma? Or we'll get a cytology specimen, even smaller, and we have to decide. And so when I trained as a cytopathologist, we just called them non-small cell. And that was fine, non-small cell carcinoma, next case. But you can't do that anymore. And so um, the lab undertook efforts uh, led by Elsa Anagnostu to try to come up with an objective way to tell these apart. How many people think this is squamous? Adno? Don't want to vote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the vast majority doesn't want to vote, and that's because it's, it's too hard. Um, there are some features of squamous, some features of an adeno here. <laughs> so here's an algorithm that we came up with we, to actually try to come up with a classifier that would define squamous from adeno. And I'll go through. These are all the proteins that we looked at that we thought could be valuable in telling a squamous from adeno, and I won't go into how we came upon these proteins. But basically, when we um, looked at all these proteins, we found only 10 were correlated tightly with histotype, and two of those were only positive in less than 5% of the tumors. So when we, held it, we started with eight proteins to build this classifier, and then used a logistic regression with stepwise selection uh, on a training set cohort, which was a cohort from Greece, and then did 1,000 bootstraps on that sample to come up with an equation that would give you the likelihood of an adenocarcinoma that's based on cytokeratin-13, TTF1, cytokeratin-5, and EGFR, and then validated that on two external cohorts um, that came from outside Yale. One cohort was actually uh, from Yale, not an outside Yale, but independent from the Greek training cohort, and then a second cohort from collaborators at, Mo at Moffitt Hospital. So this is what it, the equation ultimately looks like, and you can see that you can choose a cut point here at which above that cut point they're more likely to be an adenocarcinoma and below that cut point they're more likely to be a squamous cell carcinoma. And this is the training set, so there's no surprise that it has a very, when you look at a receiver operator curve, it has a very large area under the curve, 0.97, and that we can fairly accurately choose, uh, tell between squamous and adenocarcinoma. But that's the training set, so then we have to look at the validation set, and that's here. And so we were very pleased with this result, needless to say, an area under the curve of 0.98 is pretty incredible. But in fact, by looking at these four proteins, you really can objectively tell the difference between an adenocarcinoma and a squamous cell carcinoma. Here's another cohort that was done uh, uh, from our collaborators at the Moffitt Hospital, uh, led by Gerald Bepler. And again, the area under the curve is 0.98, so very high sensitivity and specificity, essentially both over 95% for objectively telling the difference between an adenocarcinoma and a squamous cell carcinoma. using the final diagnosis from the pathologist. But is that accurate? That's a problem. So we, the difference, however, could be that we don't have, we don't have a final. So the, the thing to, that you probably should say is maybe we need to do a clinical trial now with this as a qualifying agent to see if we're actually picking out patients that are squamous. However, the, the caveat is these were done on two tiny, core, two tiny TMA cores. So we're really looking at a very tiny amount of tissue comparable to what you'd see in a cytology or a histology specimen, which you might not get any more than that. As you well know, you might not get any more than that from a, a stage 3 or stage 4 lung cancer. And so we're able to pretty well tell, whereas these were all largely, um, actually not all, but the majority of these are stage 1 and 2, so that there was a resection specimen. Pathologists actually do better than 80% sensitivity and specificity when you give them a whole resection specimen. And also, I should say, in defense of my pathology colleagues back here, we often do IHC with some of these markers, usually not all, but some of these markers in the conventional way, and that brings you up to about 90% sensitivity and specificity. There's still some question above that, and there's arguments about whether or not there are intermediary tumors. And in fact, one of those intermediary tumors is called an adenosquamous. When we can't really decide, we'll say adenosquamous. But if you look at them, they don't, they don't come out that way. They come out as either squamuses or adenos when you do this test. And so I think that that is somewhat helpful. There are some tumors that don't fit the class at all, large cells and giant cells, and they're mixed all over. They're clearly a different biology, and we can't address those with this. This is to tell adenos from squamous cell carcinomas only. Um, and so um, finally, the last, uh, in the last 30 seconds, another way to do this that recently was published, if you're following this literature, is to use a microRNA and to just do RT-PCR on microRNA uh, 205. 
And that looks like it has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity as well. And so we're currently in the lab comparing this test, which has a very high sensitivity and specificity with that test, which you just do at RT-PCR. But it got us into the idea of microarray, and all, along with hearing from Joanne Wiedis and Frank Slack multiple times, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could measure microRNAs in all these tissue microarrays we have without grinding them up and measure them, not only that, but measure them in situ in some way to quantitate them much the way we do proteins and use those as companion diagnostics. And Jason and Seema in the lab have actually figured out how to do this. And so this is um, a cytokeratin, which is just our protein mask, but then this is MIR-21, which is a microRNA that's associated with metastasis, and this is the scrambled sequence. So we actually can see that by in situ hybridization using uh, lac nucleic acids, it looks like we can get a pretty good signal that looks fairly specific. And we're in the process of now quantitating that and, and standardizing it in the same way we did with proteins, where we look at multiple different uh, cell lines that have known levels of the microRNA and then quantitating it. This is just the cytokeratin showing the cell line spots, but this is the microRNAs that have progressively, or three cell lines that have progressively increased amounts of MIR-21. And so this is kind of what's next. I think it could be very valuable either by itself or, as you can see, in combination with cytokeratin or other protein markers to be able to determine uh, which patients are eligible for which therapies. I have a pretty big group, and I'd like to thank them all and apologize to those whose work I didn't speak about um, shown here, and the tissue microarray and, and research histology and Yale Pathology Tissue Services core group shown here, and then finally uh, our lab website and our lab group. Uh, and now I can take questions. Thank you.